Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much um, for being here, and thank you so much to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. I'm very honored and humbled to receive this uh, prize, so, and I'm very pleased to be here today to tell you a little bit about the work that I do. So I'm going to be talking about my work in schizophrenia, and I've been working at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center now for uh, about 20 years. And um, I've been doing clinical trial research, and we've been trying over the years to identify the right treatments for the right patients. So today I'm, I'm going to uh, present a couple of background slides to you, but I'm, I'm putting forth the notion that the idea of schizophrenia potentially makes up a wide variety of different patient groups that might have different underlying reasons why they develop the illness and different treatments, different side effects that may occur. So the work that we've been doing is really trying to tailor specific treatments to specific patients um, uh, 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 with schizophrenia. And I put a couple of quotes up here by Dr. Carpenter, who was mentioned earlier, who has led the research center um, since the 1970s, where he was talking about in the early 90s about let's dis let's take and break down this illness and treat people that deserve different treatments for different um, subsets of the illness. And then at the same time, our funding agencies, including the National Institutes of Mental Health, have been putting forth the notion that we should be doing this and we should be moving treatments forward. However, the most of the treatments that we have for schizophrenia right now have been developed by pharmaceutical companies and they've been treated in men and women equally and, and, and no d differences between gender or sex or genetic basis or side effect profiles. And there's no treatments that we have available right now that are approved by the FDA that are used in specific populations, like that we might see in cancer research. So the last quote here is what NIMH just redid their, their priorities, but you can read the last bullet, and they're putting forth the notion that we need to be targeting people, matching precision medicine to the specific needs of patients, and that's what I'm going to put forward today. So where, where I work, I'm at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. It was started in 1989. Um, we have 24 inpatients who stay with us for quite some time and are able to participate in a variety of research, and we um, have some time to get them the best treatments and get them out um, back integrated into the, into the communities. But, we, but we've been working on personalizing treatments there, and what's nice about the program is we've been able to inform science from the clinic and inform the decisions we make in the clinic from the science that we do. So I have many examples of clinical trials in different groups that we've, that we've worked in, and a few of them are listed here. And um, for example, uh, we've been working specifically in women, and there are very few clinical trials worldwide specifically looking at women. And, and to the, to the um, lady's comment earlier about side effects, the first um, study up here that, that I have listed this women with schizophrenia, this is it's called the damsel clinical trial, and it just finished up this year, and it was addressing side effects in women, so it was actually adding adding um, a placebo versus er low-dose aripiprazole to a regimen in women who have symptomatic high prolactin levels. So they have side effects from the antipsychotic, and we're trying to figure out how to best treat these women. And we found significant improvements, and we found the right population of women who this might benefit for. So that's one study, for example. I've been working in, the, in, in those people who are treatment resistant, and we finished a few trials here, one of which is, is the uh, med medication minocycline, which is an antibiotic that we added to um, treatment and had some effects there. Um, we've uh, completed a few studies with intranasal oxytocin for people who have some social deficits associated with their, their illness. I also have an NIMH study where I'm looking at um, the treatment of clozapine in a population of people who might have a genetic predisposition to some of the side effects. So you can see how we're targeting groups, and this is the story that I'm trying to tell about the research that we're doing. Um, but lastly, what I'm going to show you today is, is one study in particular and one topic area where we're looking at trying to understand the immune system and inflammation that occurs. So some people who have schizophrenia have specific immune dysfunction and inflammation associated with it. So I'm gonna tell you this little story uh, of, of this specific subgroup of people. And these are a lot of my research staff that are coordinating many of these studies that I'm very um, appreciative of. 
So with regards to the immune system and infl inflammation, this is a hot topic. So we see a lot of this, and I think we might even be hearing some later today from the um, uh, new investigator uh, awardees. But just to give you an idea, my colleague at Johns Hopkins had published um, several years ago showing us that um, this is from the Danish database register. So this is data that exists um, uh, uh, for, the, for the country overall. And what he had find, he's looking at risk factors associated with schizophrenia. And one of the biggest risk factors for schizophrenia was found that if you had a his, the patient had a history of an autoimmune disease or the parent had a history of an autoimmune disease, you had a 45% increased risk of having schizophrenia. So there's several other studies like this saying, well, potentially if there are, that this is related to the immune system in some way, and that this is a risk factor for the illness. And inflammation is, the, the data on inflammation is growing in this field. And these are some examples, but um, immune markers, so cytokines in the blood and then cerebral spinal fluid have been shown to be higher. And this is a widespread. Now, there are several meta-analyses on looking at, uh, at blood markers and, and being higher in some patients. Some of the genetic studies show us that the, that the links to the genes that might be involved in schizophrenia are also located in some of the immune-based genes. So they're linked in some of the HLA-mediated um, genetic uh, uh, or, or genes of interest. There's been improvement with some anti-inflammatory treatments that also evidence that there's an immune or inflammatory component. Um, prenatal maternal infection has had shown to have in the offspring, some higher immune responses, and, and, and some of our um, brain work in brain imaging has shown us that the microglial uh, in the brain, microglia, have been activated, showing us that there's inflammation occurring in the brain. So this is all evidence that there's an immune and inflammatory connection in schizophrenia. But what I'm linking this to today and what I'm going to talk to you about is a protein that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. So what is the wheat linkage in schizophrenia? And this is early work. This is, this is very early. This is from um, Dohan in the 1960s. He actually, in the 50s, put forth this notion that there's some linkage um, between the wheat ingestion and schizophrenia as we see it. And this is one of his earliest papers in the 60s. And he just showed us that during World War II, as wheat consumption decreased in Scandinavia here, as it decreased, admissions for schizophrenia decreased. At the same time in the United States, as wheat increased, use has increased, emissions for schizophrenia has also increased. So there's a few other epidemiologic studies that suggest this. But another, but another piece of his work is this study, um, this was published in the 1980s, but it showed that in countries uh, uh, like uh, uh, Papua, New, Papua New Guinea or in um, uh, Malaysia area, that in the countries where there was no wheat or very little wheat, wheat ingestion, there were no cases of schizophrenia. And you can see here, zero uh, prevalence here. Um, but in countries where we do consume wheat, there was the prevalent, or, or schizophrenia was prevalent. But what's interesting is in some of these countries here that are listed after um, the war and, and or in, in, after the, uh, sorry, 50s, 60s, and 70s, into the 1980s, um, about 30 years later, after we have introduced wheat into the diets, um, things like bread and beer, et cetera, you can see the prevalence equals about 1%, which we now know is the prevalence uh, of schizophrenia. So there it was proposed that there was some connection of wheat to schizophrenia. So here I'm showing you that gluten then is a subgroup of proteins that's found in food, such as wheat, barley, and rye, and, it's, and gliadin is the water-soluble plant protein and component of gluten. As I mentioned, there was these epidemiologic studies that connect it, but there were a few clinical trials in the early 70s and 80s. There was one or three studies that had positive findings where people got better when you took wheat out of the diet. But then in the, in the late 80s, there were three negative studies as well, and we didn't hear much more about this story, even though many people had published on this in the 60s and 70s. But what I put forward today is that no previous studies had a way to pre-select the people or a subgroup of people that might have an immune response and inflammation from wheat, so that these, these studies that were done were in all comers, and that that might not be the group of people that would be found that, who could respond to this sort of um, a mechanism of re removing gluten from the diet. Just to give you an idea of then 
how we're defining um, who has an immune reaction to, to um, gluten in the diet, we have uh, the notion that um, there's antibodies that are formed to glia, and these antibodies come and, and, and are formed to the antigen of something that comes into the body. In this, in this example, it's glia in this protein. And if you have celiac disease, it's one sort of immune type of reaction, and it forms these antibodies that I listed here. But what I'm just showing you is that celiac disease is very different than what I'm going to be talking to today, where it's just a, a sensitivity to gliadin and antibodies that are formed but not causing celiac disease, not causing inflammation of the gut and intestinal villi damage, as you do see, and the GI side effects that you see with, with celiac disease, but a separate type of immune reaction. And these antibodies that we're looking at are called anti-gliadin antibodies of the IgG type. And they're here, and this, and this study here that was published a few years ago in 2012 by Sidholm and the group, and they had showed that if you take a group of people with schizophrenia, several hundred people, and measure them for these antibodies, we find that a third of people with schizophrenia have antibodies to gliadin versus about 9% of the general population. And a few other studies, small studies have shown this, but we were able to replicate this in a few other studies. And this is the one here that just was published this past month in Schiz research Research, schizophrenia research, but we also show very similar results. We show about 32% of people have these antibodies. People are not aware of this, and about 10% of the general population have these antibodies. So then, so these people that have antibodies, what else is going on? Do we have inflammation, as I suggested? And, and yes, they do. And what this shows here is these are two cytokines in the blood, tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-1B. And so we're able to measure the blood of people with the, have we, where we've drawn the antibodies, and we've shown correlations. So this shows that the higher the amount of this antibody in the blood of people with schizophrenia, the higher the amount of the inflammatory marker that we see in the blood for both of these, and the correlations are significant. And we've recently, um, uh, or, or uh, we, actually this paper was just accepted uh, two days ago, um, and will be, will be coming out in brain and behavior immunology. But also, does it get into the brain? Does, d does there inflammation then in the brain? So we find it in the periphery, but do we see it in the brain? And what we've been able to show here is that we did um, spectroscopy, and these are neurochemicals that we can measure in the brain. And we're looking at a region in the anterior cingulate to see if these, these proxy measures that, that, are, that are higher in inflammatory disorders are also higher with these antibodies. And sure enough, look at this relationship that we see. We also see um, a correlation between the myonositol and the total choline in the blood or in the in the brain. There is a group at Johns Hopkins, Bob Yolkin and, the, and their group, and what they've been able to show is that these specific antibodies do cross the blood-brain barrier in people with schizophrenia but not in healthy controls. So they looked at cerebral spinal fluid and the blood, and what they were able to show is almost a perfect correlation between what the, the, the measures of this antibody in the blood and the brain were, and that suggests then that there potentially is um, a, a component of having potentially a leaky blood-brain barrier in, in, in uh, people with schizophrenia, which may also be contributing to the inflammation that we see in the brain. But the point is that these antibodies are formed, they're associated with inflammation, they cross the blood-brain barrier, and they're getting into the brain in equal amounts. So we took this subgroup of people then, these people with high inflammation and these antibodies who have schizophrenia, and we gave them the opportunity, and this was a pilot study where two people came into the inpatient setting, and we wanted to see if we remove this antigen of gliadin from their diet completely, would we be able to improve symptoms? And this is an open-label study, and it was only two weeks in length. But you can see here that, um, whoops, move this back. Sorry about that. So you can see these two people. This is this is a BPRS score here, and this is improving in um, uh, uh, the first patient on total BPRS. This is the SANS, which measures negative symptoms. So our patients were getting a lot better in some of these core negative symptoms that antipsychotics don't do a good job in improving. But in some of the neurologic side effects too, the two people or the one person who had neurologic side effects associated with the illness, uh, akathisia and stiffness, for example, completely disappeared once we removed this antigen from the body. So then what is the subgroup I mentioned? The subgroup then, these people that I'm looking at are these people who have these high antibodies, the AGA, IgG. They have high peripheral 
inflammation, there's inflammation in the brain. There's some evidence, and I'm not showing you this data, but there's some evidence that there's gut permeability. We're measuring um, smooth junction permeability measurements by a protein called zonulin in the, in the gut. I'm working with um, the celiac center from Harvard with this, but we show that zonulin levels are higher, and that's another whole story for another day, but it's very interesting how gut permeability is related. We're actually working with Dr. Robert Schwartz from the research center as well, and we show that in people who have high um, uh, antibodies, they also have high chynurinin, which might be linked to schizophrenia and could explain this potentially. These people, um, when, you look at, when you look at symptoms, I see somewhat lower positive symptoms overall on population basis, but they're hard to distinguish cl clinically, and the only way I can do that right now is with the, with the antibodies. But like I said, they might respond to removal of um, antigen uh, of, of gliadin from the, from the gut. So then what did we do? We, did a, we, 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 we started a, a small study, a feasibility study, because NIMH was worried that we couldn't actually complete a study like this where we removed um, um, uh, gluten from the diet. So we, we, we were funded for up to 20 people. And what we did is we um, admitted people to our inpatient unit who had wanted to come in and stay. It was a double-blind, randomized, gluten-free inpatient feasibility study for five weeks. All people that came into the research center then for this study had a gluten-free diet. All meals were gluten-free, and we introduced then a protein shake in the afternoon where they had 10 grams of, 10 grams of gluten flour versus 10 grams of um, rice flour, randomized, double-blind. We didn't know who was getting what. Um, patients um, uh, were also discharged on a gluten-free diet. We followed them for eight weeks and, and showed them how to shop, how to buy their food, et cetera, and we followed them for an additional eight weeks. Uh, but this was, as I mentioned, the very first study to, in people with schizophrenia to select patients on antibodies. And um, um, however, this was a small feasibility study. We had some interesting findings I'll show you here. We found that we could admit people, people did well. There were people lined up to do this, to do this study. Um, we had 17 people complete. Um, we had cooking classes and, and, and family involvement was very important. We, saw, we didn't see a significant improvement in positive symptoms in the study, but we did find improvement, significant improvements in cognition, especially in the area of attention, and also, as I'll show you here, in negative symptoms. And this was here in the five weeks that negative symptoms were significantly improving compared to placebo here over the five-week period. So we then took this data. We were very excited. This is new data, and we're very excited about this subgroup of people because negative symptoms are very hard to treat, and some of our people are, 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 are really getting some improvement in this area. So we now have an NIMH study where we're funded to look at the confirmatory effects of this gluten-free diet in this subgroup of people. Um, we're also examining mechanisms of action. So I mentioned to you about gut permeability. We're doing a lot of testing on gut permeability because it might have some relationship. And, and as we talk about removing gluten from the diet as a intervention, it's, a diet is very difficult, but there's ways that, that medication and pharmacologic treatments can be developed potentially if we could prove this is um, indeed something that we can um, target, if this is a target of the illness. There are ways to close up the intestinal perm, uh, the permeability of the smooth junctions in the gut. There are inhibitors of that protein called zonulin that are being tested that we're trying to get our hands on. So, and, and then there's potentially um, preventing altogether um, uh, and possibly the prevention in the future of maybe this subgroup from developing schizophrenia if we can stop this inflammatory response from happening altogether. So there's lots of thoughts that can be extended way beyond just the diet if we can prove that this in, is in fact a, a, a treatment that works for negative symptoms. So on, we're on, we have an ongoing study now. We're working with Johns Hopkins as well. They're our partner in this. We're screening over 800 people in, in the state of Maryland and people who test positive are able to come in. So just lastly, just a, a couple of other ideas um, that we, are things that we have going on in the clinic besides studies like this. Um, we are working, I'm working with um, engineers. We're developing electrochemical sensing of things in the blood like clozapine and white blood cell count to be able to look, make, develop point of care monitors in the clinics. We're looking at other biomarkers like oxidative stress. Um, we're looking at trauma and its relationship in women. We're doing some microbiome work in schizophrenia. We have a Stanley Foundation funded grant to look at um, 
a Chinese herbal, and we're also doing some innovative work looking at um, the use of social media as it predicts uh, the onset of schizophrenia and depressive, depressive symptoms. And I just wanted to point out that some of these work here, funded by the Brain and Behavioral Research Center, NARSAD grants, um, by some of my um, junior, um, uh, met, uh, junior colleagues and mentors. We have had three funded projects that have been um, uh, really contributed to the science as it moves forward and other grants that have come out of it. So just to finish up, this is Ellen Sachs, many of you might be familiar with, who has schizophrenia. And this is a quote that I like. She says, my good fortune is not that I've recovered from mental illness. I have not, nor will I ever. My good fortune lies in having found my life. And I propose that we're all on a journey, and I'm on a journey in the work that I do to help each person find the best of their lives and find best treatments that match um, what they need and to help looking for discoveries that might be important for each individual person. So I thank BBRF and others. This is my team. I just want to point out I have a large team working on clinical trials because it takes a village to do clinical trial research, and I thank all of them. <laughs> and also um, others at MPRC, others outside of MPRC, and supporters, um, Stanley Foundation, BBRF for sure has funded um, a lot of my trainees, and it's, it, it, it has been a big piece of, uh, of, of the work that we do. And I thank to, also to um, the Maltz family for, this, uh, for their support and in this innovative um, award, and also to the families and patients that, we, that participate in all of our studies. So I thank you so much for your attention. We can get the lights up again, please. Great. Qu uh, questions for Dr. Kelly? Well, well, again, yeah, right here. Oops. Are your slides oh. available online? I, I think we can make them available, uh, the slides, I'm sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, and, and the talks are all going to be available online, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So and here was this uh, young lady here. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to know, although it's not one of your topics, what you think about the use of high quality fish oil. I'm a mother of a consumer, and I've had a lot of success. High quality fish oil works well. Right. So the question is about the use of high quality fish oil, and she was asking what I thought about that. And so this also has some anti-inflammatory properties. And there's a, there was a study out, um, or I think it was Dr. Aminger and his group several years ago, looking at the, pre the um, uh, prevention of onset of schizophrenia in high-risk patients. And those who were taking fish oil were less likely to um, uh, move into having the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Now, there's been a few studies since that have questioned if that is really uh, uh, the case, so they've had trouble replicating that initial finding. But all that said is there, the data, I think, suggests that it does have some anti-inflammatory properties that are very important. And we have just um, finished um, a, a, a study. With, I'm working with Bob Buchanan at the Research Center. I think it's funded by um, Mark Weiser's here, the Stanley Foundation. It was a, a fish oil plus a few other anti-inflammatories. Um, also, we haven't analyzed the data yet, but we have high hopes for that. I certainly hear a lot of people that do take it, and we do. Um, and and, and uh, Deanna Perkins, who is the uh, directs the Prodrome Clinic, the Oasis Clinic at UNC, does recommend fish oil for her early onset um, because it, it doesn't have a lot of side effects associated with it, and the evidence suggests that it could um, help. So, yes, thanks for bringing that up, and I think absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Over here. Yeah. I was curious, in the removal Yeah, yeah, we'll repeat the question uh, yeah. if you can. Yeah. 
Okay. No, it's a, it's a good question. So in the study that we were doing, we're specifically looking at... Um, uh, repeat the question. Oh, sorry. She, she wanted to know if we did anything else in the study, like looking at um, uh, the smoking cessation and other things that might be related to diet in the study. So we did the inpatient study, and we contained everyone's diet so we would have very similar um, uh, diet in, in each person. We do note if they, we do note exactly what they do eat each day in a diet recall. Um, so we are able to control for that to see if people coming in with high wheat diets made a difference, et cetera. And when we discharge people um, for those eight weeks, we have, we, we do a diet recall, but we are now using an app. So we're now teaching everybody how to use an app so they can keep track of their diet daily so we can keep track of that. We do track smoking and we control for that in the analysis. We actually stratified that for that in the clinical trial too because there is an, a big infl inflammatory component to smoking. We also are collecting stool samples and have for the studies and haven't analyzed that yet but the the idea and you'll hear about this later from uh, Mary about the microbiome but the potentially the uh, a modulation of the gut um, bacteria could potentially play a role in how uh, symptoms are, are, are seen etc so we, we have control we do control for that and we do collect that data as well um, I think did I answer all those questions yeah, I think, was there I one think more thing no, but we're, we're going to have to move on because okay. we're running. But I'll be happy to talk to you more. Sure. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks.